Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Homies, homegirls, homeboys, home trans, all the work from home people out there. I'm your host, Naresh Fissa with Adam Schrader. You are listening to the Work From Home Show, and we have an awesome, awesome guest with us. He is one of the most well-known remote working entrepreneurs in the world. Yeah. His oh, name really? is Leon. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm excited about that. They don't even know who I am Put yet. that on your business card. Yeah. He, well, here's why. It's because he is the co-founder of the Running Remote Conference. It's the largest remote conference in the world. And he's also the co-founder and chief marketing officer of Time Doctor. We'll talk about Time Doctor in a little bit. And Staff.com, I think some of our listeners have used Staff.com. Well, again, he's a co-founder and chief marketing officer of all those different ventures and businesses. Again, his name is Liam Martin. It's really an honor to have him on the show. Liam, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. I am uh, drinking Corona, by the way. Just for everyone that's listening, um, I got so I got my Rona too. So oh, let's, perfect. Let's have a let's have a happy hour today. I think we'll have a good discussion about work from home and remote working. So I want to start off this discussion by talking about your background and how you got started working and leading remotely. It's not just about working remotely, but leading remotely is a very difficult task to pull off. Sure. And so you've started businesses and led teams of hundreds of people remotely. So tell us, how did you get started working and leading remotely? So um, Leah Martin, human being located on planet Earth, more specifically Canada, been working remotely for about 15 years. And um, the last couple projects have been basically been leading a serious remote team for the past 10. <clears throat> and I started... In grad school, ironically enough, I, I don't know if you guys know McGill University, but yep. it's a uh, school it's the best, in best school yeah, in Canada. Pretty good school in Canada. I ended up going to grad school there, and uh, I was teaching for the very first time, and that was kind of my my goal, right? This was this was like 2007, 2008, which <laughs> wow, full circle, uh, which was like right before the last economic collapse, and now we're in the middle of the next one, um, which is pretty wacky. But uh, I was teaching at McGill as a lecturer, and this was kind of like my my plan, right? I was going to go into academia. Started with about 300 students for my first full-on professorship, ended up with less than 200 by the end of the semester, and got some of the worst academic reviews in the history of the department. And the department was running for 211 years. I walked Maybe into my don't put that on your office. business card. Yeah, well, I mean, that was just, <laughs> I walked to my supervisor's office and I told him, uh, I don't think I'm very good at this. And he said, no, you are not. And I said, so what do you think I should do? And he's like, well, you got to really do this lecturing thing for the next 20 years before you actually get to do anything fun. So either get a lot better at that or figure something else out to do. Threw a master's thesis under his door two weeks later and I was out into the real world and turn that into my first remote business, which was an online tutoring company. Um, grew that tutoring company to a couple dozen tutors throughout North America and Europe. Um, ended up actually getting into a little bit of remote consulting. And one of the biggest problems that I had inside of the tutoring business was equating for the amount of time a tutor worked with a student. So if a I would bill a student for 10 hours and the student wouldn't come back to me saying, I didn't work with my tutor for 10 hours. I work with them for five. And then I'd go to the tutor and I'd say, did you work with 10 hours for Jimmy? And he'd say, of course, that's why I billed you for 10 hours. And then I'd end up having to refund the student for those five hours, but pay the tutor for the full 10 hours. 
And that was the problem that basically brought on Time Doctor, which is the other tool that we use or built, uh, which is time tracking for remote teams. Then about two or three years ago, actually three years ago now, uh, we ended up really trying to figure out how we could scale our remote company. We're about 100-ish people right now in 37 different countries all over the world. And we said, well, how do we get to 300 people, 500 people? Like, you know, where's the playbook for that? And ironically, and again, we're talking about this post-COVID, basically early June, late May uh, in 2020. So we're in a bit of a flux right now. There was no information on how to ba basically build a remote team. There was zero. There was a whole bunch of information on like how to hire a virtual assistant, how to use Upwork, how to use Fiverr. But there was very little on like how to lead a large remote team um, to success. So I knew that that was something I was very passionate about. And we decided to start another project, which was running remote, which is not how to hire your first person, but it's how to hire your 10th person or your 100th person or really scale a remote business. So one of the things that you were saying is that back in 08, you were starting this. Now, working from home wasn't unheard of then, but it wasn't exactly prevalent. How did you decide that tutoring was something that could be done online? Like what gave you that thought? Because there are a lot of people out there who, who have businesses and might be wondering, can I do this? Can I run my right. business remotely? What made you realize, yes, this is something that can be done remotely? Well, not only can it be done remotely, but I would say right now, it's one of the best opportunities you could possibly get your head around is mm -hmm. tutoring online. Um, I can tell you how I fell into it very easily. I was tutoring kids in person after grad school because I had no money. And I realized I was actually making more money tutoring kids than I was as a lecturer. Because literally, as a lecturer at McGill, you get paid, I think I was paid like 2500 Canadian, which is probably about 2000 US, for the entire semester for one class. I think it worked out to like I was getting paid a dollar an hour. Um, it, was, it was really not a good it's situation. It's similar. Even in the US, that's similar type of salary a graduate student would get to be right. basically a, a graduate assistant. It's, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, when in prison... You, know, you get paid like eight cents an hour. It's like you got to do it because it's critical to your career. And unfortunately, there's no way to get around it. You've just got to basically work for, for a buck an hour. So I realized that tutoring was a way for me to solve that problem. And then me being the entrepreneurial type person, uh, at least from a personality perspective, I said, well, what if I, I can scale this? Like I'm taking, I'm working with a student for two hours then I'm getting on the metro, the subway, and I'm traveling an hour and a half to see the next student. Why don't I just not do that? Why don't I just do everything on Skype? That was it. And literally, and at that time, 2008, Skype was worked, but it wasn't like, you couldn't shoot, you know, you couldn't be doing 1080p video calls with people. Um, so it was a little... It was a little difficult to be able to implement, but it definitely worked and there was a need there. Um, but even today, I mean, if you want to get a business started, uh, you can start tutoring kids immediately. And um, it's it's a, almost a zero barrier to entry in terms of selling your time online like that. Yeah, you touched on these online sites where you can hire freelancers like Upwork and Fiverr. And I've got to say, I don't think I would have a business if it weren't for those sites. They uh -huh. have been a not just a lifesaver, but I've actually created business models because of the talent that I've been able to find, the really good, high-quality talent I've been able to find from, on those sites. I'm a huge fan, big, big fan. What are your thoughts on using not just Fiverr and Upwork, but also overseas workers and independent contractors, maybe domestically in Canada and the United States, but just regular independent contractors. What are your thoughts on these different resources to uh, find and utilize talent and capital? So uh, I'll preface this with Mika, who's the CEO of Fiverr, is a friend of ours. He was just on the last Running Remote event that we did. Um, so take this with a grain of salt. But I believe that Fiverr, Upwork, Freelancer, 
are all platforms that really empower labor from developing countries to be able to get access to work opportunities that otherwise would have been completely cut off to them. Uh, we have a, a short, which you can check out on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash running remote or type in Fahim running remote. And it's a short about uh, Fahim, who is a friend of mine from Bangladesh. He lives about an hour outside of Dhaka and he has muscular dystrophy. And he this, the story basically shows how he went from begging in the streets, literally selling hand-woven um, rugs to collecting enough money to get a computer and then also collecting enough money to be able to get internet access and then teaching himself design and teaching himself basically graphic design. And he is now one of the top graphic designers uh, on Fiverr and on Upwork and is making many, many multiples. We're talking, I mean, I don't want to disclose his exact numbers, but he's making basically a U.S. Um, equivalent, like I would say uh, a Midwest U.S. equivalent in terms of his earning capacity. And there's nothing on there talking about how he has muscular dystrophy. He literally moves his hand <laughs> uh, and and that's it. And it's just an incredibly ins inspiring story. Uh, a lot of the times we talk about remote work and I, t well, I kind of have a terminology for the tech startup remote worker, which is the MacBook Pro remote worker. If you can afford a MacBook Pro, you're part of the global 1%. And uh, I think we need to also be mindful of the other 99% that are really getting access to work opportunities that no one would have been able to get access to had it not been for websites like Upwork and Fiverr and Freelancer. So I'm very passionate about trying to empower people all over planet Earth uh, to be able to work remotely. Yeah, and I also, I got started hiring overseas contractors through these platforms probably seven years ago. And mm -hmm. I actually, when I whenever I go to India, I try to make it a point to to meet up with these people because they are real people. You just kind of forget that they're real people with families and with lives. And so I met up with uh, some of our web developers and kind of similar story. It turned out that the the head web web developer, the person who who founded kind of that little uh, f uh, form of of web development, he mm -hmm. was handicapped and he couldn't walk. And mm -hmm. he, here I was working with him for several years and had no clue about him or his family or anything, which which I actually kind of like about the whole culture of of these platforms. It's just let's get down to business and not waste time with the stuff that, that you would waste time with in, in, in an office setting. But when I saw him in person, I was, yeah, like you said, I was quite inspired, like, holy smokes, like he doesn't even have a leg. And right. uh, you know, he's he's our web developer. That's, that's, that's so cool. badass. I just like the, the other thing that is is amazing and we can kind of get into this later throughout the rest of the, the questions. But, you know, we're in a time where remote work is currently exploding. And I actually think counterintuitively, we just had Twitter and Google and Shopify and Facebook all kind of say, hey, you can work remotely. Um, and we're seeing probably within the next year or two. 100,000 plus $200,000 a year employees out of San Francisco and Boston and New York that are going to be working remotely. And I actually think this is the time for Mumbai and for Manila and for Dhaka and for all of these other and, and Kiev and all of these countries that have amazing talent to be able to start to compete for those high end jobs because now that geography is no longer important, at least mm -hmm. for this top tier of developer, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see a very interesting debate about what is talent, you know, what is the actual ROI of talent? Um, and at least on our side, because we have the data, <laughs> we know that a lot of this talent is as good as the talent in San Francisco. It's just that that job has been geographically locked in for so many years and now it's open. So what do you think as more and more people go remote, how is uh, how are things like Fiverr and Upwork and just the ability to hire workers everywhere, how is that impacting um, businesses and you know employees um, 
money going forward. I mean, I know a lot of people are concerned and saying, hey, my employer is going to start looking for people on Upwork, Fiverr, and how do I justify my salary? What are your thoughts on that? It's true. You will have to justify your salary. Um, if the talent's better, you'll get that talent. So I'll give you an example. We set a price band for our talent, and then we don't care where we get it. So um, we hired a developer about two years ago, a story I always like to use. 60 something thousand US was the salary. Uh, and you could probably get an okay developer in the Midwest for about 60 something thousand. However, we ended up getting the guy that got third place in the Facebook hackathon, uh, but he was in Indonesia. And he got a $600,000 offer from Facebook, and he said no to that offer because he had to move to Palo Alto. And instead, he decided to work for one-sixth of, or one-tenth of that for us, uh, which we were very happy to be able to take him on because he was an absolute top-tier developer, but he wanted to stay in Indonesia. He did not want to move to the United States. Uh, that will start happening everywhere. You will see that for every possible job that you can think of. And I think Upwork and Fiverr are also going to be, we use um, both of those platforms internally as an augmenter for staff. So as an example, let's say I need a small task done, like um, I need um, a Facebook pixel installed. We have a guy on Fiverr and we probably pay that guy 10 bucks to be able to do that. But everyone knows inside of the marketing team that that resource is there and we can literally just make a request and it gets done. Um, so I think those two forces are going to be very interesting, but I think you're probably going to see, I don't think you're going to see those jobs drop in terms of the salary, but the competition is going to get 20x more intense within the next, literally within the next year uh, to 18 months. Yeah, and talking about uh, I guess these platforms replacing a full-time staff or working with a full-time staff. Uh, I don't think these platforms can completely replace Americans or Canadians or people in your virtual office per se. You're still going to need a project manager, for example, who's going to manage the Fiverr people. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you said you needed a Facebook pixel them. And mm -hmm. In-house, either your developer is too busy for that, or maybe you don't have the developer. Well, you're going to need somebody. It's not going to be you because you're the co-founder yep. and CEO, CMO. Mm -hmm. Somebody within your company, or some, you need to hire someone with your, within your company who's that project manager who will get in touch with the person on Elance and say, hey, we need this Facebook pixel done for $10. Then let's say you need a banner created, that, created that's a 728 by 90. Well, again, you maybe don't have a designer on staff, or maybe yep. you do have the designer who's completely slammed with something else, and your project manager then steps in and gets in touch with the designer and hires a designer, and boom, the project is done within 24 hours. Um, that's how I see. Um, that's how I see kind of the the economy, this this kind of tech economy changing moving forward where project management now becomes more important than ever because even though countries are trying to become more isolationist, especially with this pandemic, countries are afraid, people are afraid to visit other countries and are afraid to do business with other countries. Well, the online and digital and tech community is becoming more global than ever. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're, you hit the nail on the head in terms of understanding that process. So we also have like $400,000 a year employees inside of the company, right? Like, and the reason why is because that was the market rate for that person. But we didn't say, hey, we're only going to look for that person in San Francisco and New York. We said, let's look for that person on planet Earth. Um, and, and there's tons of examples of people that we pick up that are, uh, we have a, we have a guy that um, is in, um, oh, I can't remember exactly where it is in Africa. Darn. It's in the Horn of Africa. Um, oh, and, uh, Johannesburg? Or? Uh, sorry, Nigeria. He's in Nigeria. Nigeria. And he's being paid 
uh, 6,000 US per month, which is ridiculous in Nigeria. Like the average salary per month is $200. <laughs> um, but he was the best person for the job. So we don't even look where they're, like we don't include where they're from in terms of our search because we don't need to. Uh, so we just figure out, okay, well, do they have, uh, the HR team basically just says, do they have more than three hours of sync time with their direct report? If that is correct, then it's moved on to the next stage in the process. And it, it's like, that's the right model, uh, in my opinion. And um, you shouldn't be biased by location. And I think that the end game for this is there will be no bias for location. With that said, countries like the United States are perfectly structured to be able to take advantage of those top tier jobs. But I would say that there's also been a bit of a bias recently, I mean, up until right now, where you've hired that talent just in San Francisco, because that's the only place that you were really looking for uh, that talent. But once you expand it out, things are going to change. And I think there's going to be a lot more competition. I don't know if you saw, Liam, but Facebook announced and, and other tech companies have announced that they are opening up that talent pool. However, yeah. they're reducing the salary or increasing the salary, but they're going to adjust the salaries based on where people live. And it, it's kind of assumed that because Facebook is pretty much in San Francisco Bay Area, they uh, if there's going to be a reduction in salary. But that's their model. It's Facebook, one of the four largest companies in the world, said that they're essentially going to be redu reducing salaries uh, if they hire people outside of, of San Francisco and California. Yeah. I don't necessarily, they can do whatever they want. It's Facebook, it's their company, it's Zuckerberg's company. Uh, but if you guys are paying market value for a guy in, in Nigeria, then to me it would make sense that the, the Facebooks and Googles would pay market value as well. Yeah, I think there'll be an interesting, very short race to the bottom and I'm talking like within the next 18 months. Well, let's let's talk about this all like post COVID, right? Because that's a really good way to kind of structure this this discussion. Um, once there's a vaccine, you're gonna have a hundred thousand people in San Francisco that are gonna leave San Francisco because they no longer have to be there, and they are going to go to uh, if they're not married and they don't have any children, they're going to go to Bali, Changu. Ho Chi Minh City, like they're going to, uh, Medellin, they're going to go to these like location independence hotspots. Yeah. And then there's a whole bunch of other people that are going to go to the Midwest. Um, right now, if you live in a city that has about a million people and a good university in it, you are going to see a lot more tech bros enter your city because the cost per square foot in those types of environments are like, 6x better than in San Francisco. Uh, you know, if you get a one bedroom apartment in San Francisco for $5,000, that's crap. For $5,000 a month, I can get an eight bedroom house in the Midwest. That's a mansion, right? That's that's amazing. So I think you're going to see all of that talent kind of disperse. Then once all of that talent disperses, you're probably then like Facebook and I, I think every other company that's higher remote at scale right now is going to recognize yeah, there was a certain price for talent and it was artificially high in San Francisco, New York and Boston and Toronto and all of these major hubs. And then there's going to be an equalization because we know that we can go and find someone who's actually much better in uh, Minneapolis, as an example, as opposed to or the talent, the, the person that we need is in Minneapolis and this is the price that they're willing to pay. But two years after coronavirus ends and we have a vaccine, those prices will start to go up and you'll just have top tier talent will be top tier talent anywhere on planet earth. So it doesn't matter where it's located, uh, which is really the end goal for me uh, that I would like to see because I think it's, it's very, um, it's very kind of a weird globalist mentality to be able to say simply because you live in San Francisco, you should be paid a hundred thousand dollars more. It should be because you're good at your job that you're paid a hundred thousand dollars more. Yeah, I think we're going to see a whole lot more. Uh, I'm in Austin, Texas, and I think you're going to see a whole lot more states saying what Austin does, and they say, uh, "Don't California my Texas," and so yeah. we might see that uh, a whole lot more in other places. Austin is going to blow up, and I know Austin is. <laughs> I mean, Austin is one of my favorite cities in the world, and uh, Austin has definitely changed over the last <laughs> ten years that I've been, you know, that I've been traveling there. Uh, 
and it's going to change a lot more yeah. because it is just you know, and you have a weird monoculture in the valley where everyone thinks exactly the same way um that is probably going to like i so i'll do a one dollar bet with anybody on the podcast right now the cost of real estate in san francisco will be will be a it will be the top three loser in terms of drops in real estate in North America. So I think San Francisco is probably going to get hurt more than most other cities simply because it's just so overpriced and you had to go there in order to get these jobs. I have a friend of mine that works for Netflix. He makes 370,000. He's Canadian. And he said, uh, I would have, I make more money with my $75,000 job living in Montreal, Canada. So I have more take home pay from my $75,000 job in Montreal, Canada than I did making 370 for Netflix in the Valley. Um, that's a model that's just going to equalize out. You think the real estate will be worse in San Francisco than in say New oh. York City, which has these huge commercial buildings? You said top three. Well, yeah, I, I said top three. So oh, top three, um, okay. I my bets that way. But <laughs> I think that New York is probably like the the biggest drops are going to be um, San Francisco, Seattle, Boston, New York, Toronto, Vancouver, because that's where I mean a lot of that tech talent is located, and they are very comfortable with not with moving because they they've already understood remote work. They you know they they're acquainted with it. They probably have friends that work remotely, so it's going to be a very easy move for them. And if you can put away an extra hundred grand a year by moving from San Francisco to Austin, as an example. Um, I mean, for me, I would totally live in no Austin brainer. as opposed to San Francisco. That's a no brainer. Not only is it, you know, like San Francisco doesn't suck, but Austin is way better <laughs> as a city. So like, why would I want to live in San Francisco when I can live in Austin and get an extra hundred grand a year? That's amazing. That's a win-win. Now, as an as a business owner or somebody looking to hire people, how can you be sure? I mean, you know, whenever you want to hire people right now, you have them come to the office, you talk to them, you do this, you do that. How do you make sure you're hiring people who are going to fit in your office and talk to your talent whenever you're doing it virtually and remotely? Just in terms of the cultural fit? Well, the cultural fit the, and also, you know, how do you make sure that, um, you know, that you are getting the top tier talent that you're looking for? Well, that's an interesting one. Uh, we have a different process, uh, and our process is, is probably not the standard method that everyone else uh, does, but I, I can bring you through it very quickly. The general thesis that we have is it is way faster to be able to hire a remote worker than it is a in-person worker, right? It's 36% faster to hire remote than it is in person, even if you're doing full employment. So basically you're, you're just getting someone to accept an employment contract. Uh, what we do is we say, okay, uh, let's say we have, uh, I'm just trying to hire a VP of marketing right now. So we have 500 candidates on the front end. We do not start the process unless we have more than 500 candidates. That's filtered down to approximately 100. I do a first swipe through those um, those resumes. If I see a company that I know of, so in this case, I was looking for someone that has SaaS experience. I would look through those companies, figure out who has SaaS experience, get to the second tier, which is probably about 20-ish resumes. From there, I go to about 10 interviews. I do those interviews, figure out who um, are probably the top two that I want to do an offer for. And this is the difference between us and everyone else is we hire two at minimum. Sometimes we even hire three and we have them work with us paid for anywhere from a week to a month. The longest that we've gone is two months. And it's a really cost-effective way to be able to figure out whether or not their resume is full of it. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on your podcast. I've been drinking Corona, but, uh, you know. Yes, please we, do. We swear all the time. Booyah. So okay, it. great. <laughs> so the... Um, so you get down to two candidates, you hire those two candidates, and you get them to do the same thing for a week. It's so simple. 
And you can't do this in an office because you can't have, you know, Adam and Naresh looking at each other in the same office, realizing, oh man, this is, this is my competition. And sometimes we end up hiring both people, but a lot of the times we end up only hiring one person, but it's a way for us to be able to check our math and confirm that that resume was legit. Uh, and that for me is, that's been one of the best hiring hacks that we've done because we even put bets down before before we actually go into that trial period, who do we think the winner is gonna be? And I mean, my success rate is about 70%, which is nuts. Meaning 30% of the time, I made the wrong choice for a really important hire, for a six figure hire, right? For someone that's managing like 10, 20, 30 people. And um, it just boils down to a lot of the times when someone fills out a resume or someone gives you a resume, a lot of the times it's bullshit in the resume. Like they just don't, they didn't do mm. what they say that they did. And <laughs> by being able to work with them for a week, you're like, oh, well, didn't you run a campaign where you were doing $100,000 in ad spend on Facebook per month? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, well, do that now. Go do that right now. <laughs> and let's see what happens in a week. Here's 50 grand. Let's see what happens. And if you don't come back with anything, it's like, shit, yeah, you didn't really understand what you were doing. So, um, yeah, I mean, th that for me is, it, it's such a faster model. Um, and it also just cuts through a lot of the crap with people where it's just like, listen, I can, you know, we can keep talking or I can just deploy you in the field for a week and see whether or not you're the right fit for us and we're the right fit for you. And a lot of people like that methodology. Moving on to software and technology, Time Doctor, Stop.com. Before we start promoting Stop.com and Time Doctor, what are your must-haves as far as resources, tools, software, and technology go? Just in terms of like what we use internally? No, for, for, for remote workers, for our listeners who might be working remotely or at home for the first time okay. in their careers. I mean, I would probably say, if we're talking about the remote worker and not the remote business owner, uh, get a comfortable chair. <laughs> that, that, like, be comfortable in your space. I'm currently using the Bose SoundTrue Ultras. They're $70 earbuds. They are very, very comfortable. Uh, they have a very comfortable ear cup that goes into my head, but more importantly, they have some of the best microphones. Bose has some of the best microphones in the industry. And we buy these for everyone inside of the company. Uh, we make sure I have like 10 of them that just float around everywhere. Uh, get yourself an external monitor. I have a 32 inch external monitor. It connects through USB type C to my laptop. Costs me about 350 bucks. Super easy. Um, that is enormous. Use, yeah, it's, it, and you can get a very simplistic monitor that's very big. And the reason why it's 32 inches is because I can put like four panels on it. So I can constantly monitor the database and see whether or not our server is going to crash at any point. That's one of those things that 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 monitor is that particular uh, panel is really, really important about four times a year because we'll end up at a point where one of our nodes will go down. And then, you know, every minute that we're sitting there, it's like 800 tickets inside of the software that are, that are loading up. So that's really important. Um, I use the MX Master 3. It's a wireless mouse. It's amazing. Um, you know, in terms of just regular software tools, Zoom, if you want to pay for it, Skype, if you want to not pay for it, uh, go to speedtest.net, run a speed test. This is more for the employers and have them send you back the URL. If they have below 25 and uh, up or down, upgrade their internet. It's very simplistic. We use one password. That's our cipher system for all of our passwords. Um, Slack, Twist, uh, Trello, Stormboard for you know G Suite, Google Apps for business. That's totally worth the money. I mean, I can go on and on in terms of in terms of tools, but you probably have a pretty good idea of what kind of technology stack you want to do already. If you're listening to this podcast, it just you know, you should just be constantly evolving that stack and really almost kind of auditing it on like a quarterly basis. Cool. So Liam Martin, you're the co-founder and CMO of Time Doctor, the running remote conference in mm -hmm. staff.com. This is part one of our interview with you. It's been really, really helpful 
to our listeners, stick around for part two. It's going to be coming up on the next episode. We're going to talk about a little bit more uh, about Time Doctor, the running remote conference, staff.com, and other software and technology that can help you manage your employees, manage your businesses remotely. So once again, stick around for that next episode. It's going to be part two of our interview. His website's staff.com, as we already mentioned. There's also runningremote.com if you're interested in the running remote conference and timedoctor.com, timedoctor.com. And of course, we are the work from home show. That's www.workfromhomeshow.com, workfromhomeshow.com. And until next time, keep on working from home. <laughs>